endoplastic, plasmacytoid, dendritic cell neoplasm. And thankfully, it is better known as BPDCN, and it was previously known as natural killer uh, cell leukemia lymphoma, and it is categorized by the World Health Organization as an acute myeloid leukemia. Now, typically, BPDCN presents with features of both lymphoma and leukemia. There are few data on the biology, and there is no established standard of care. So this really sounds like an unmet need that we really need to talk about. So to do that, I am with Dr. Naveen Pemrashu, who is an MD and an assistant professor in the Department of Leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. First off, thank you very much. And so from now on, we can just refer to it as BPDCN. Yes, indeed. Before we talk about the trial, how did you get involved with this particular investigation? of this particular agent? Well, what a great question. Oftentimes with rare diseases, and especially rare cancers, Rick, it ends up being that it's a patient or a patient story that drives uh, the passion, and that's what happened to me. I had the fortune of taking care of actually a very young patient. Typically, this is usually a disease of older adults, but it was a young man who uh, was a high school football player, had his future ahead of him, and was given this rare diagnosis. This is now seven or eight years ago. And as you mentioned nicely, this was right around the time that the World Health Organization was reclassifying, giving a formal name to this disease, BPDCN, and a formal diagnostic criteria. So it turns out that it was one particular patient, one particular story that really drove me to have a passion and a career-long focus for BPDCN. So what are you presenting here? What's the, the news? Well, the big news since the time that I took care of that patient eight years ago, when really most of us didn't have a name or really have an idea of what the disease was, what it entailed, and there was and still remains no standard of therapy, it set the stage for what I presented yesterday here at ASCO. What I presented was a targeted therapy, a novel therapy approach, which hits a target called CD123, or IL-3 receptor alpha, which turns out that almost 100% of patients with this rare disease, BPDCN, overexpress. And so in that setting, because as you said, there are no standard of care therapies, people are borrowing from either AML, ALL, or lymphoma experiences, we found that there was an urgent need for, for new therapies for these patients. So I presented the preliminary ongoing results from that study. And what are you finding? So far the results have been encouraging. As I showed yesterday in our slide set, patients uh, have been enrolled in both the frontline setting, that is BPDCN patients who have not yet received any therapy, and also patients, as you might expect, who are relapse refractory. They've had prior therapies. And in all lines of therapy, we report an 89% overall response rate. That means that the vast majority of patients so far on this ongoing clinical trial have had what's called a major objective response. So that's very encouraging to see that. And in terms of responses, you're showing marked disease reductions in skin, bone marrow, lymph node, and viscera. That's exactly right. So this rare disease, BPDCN, which, as you said, has features of sort of multiple different hematologic yeah. cancers. It's a very protean manifestation, and you said it. It has leukemia and lymphoma features, but also the vast majority of patients will have skin involvement. So that's fairly rare for a blood cancer. There are other cancers such as cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and mycosis fungoides that have similar profiles, but these are two different biologies. And so as you're asking, we did develop for the first time a prospective set of response criteria to measure these three major compartments, skin, lymph nodes and bone marrow. And you're right, the responses that we're seeing so far are in all three of these compartments. Wow. Now in terms of safety, what are you finding? Safety is very important. We showed these data yesterday. The most common adverse events seen thus far, the majority of patients are experiencing what's called transaminase elevation, that is AST or ALT, liver test elevations. Fortunately, so far these appear to be transient usually appear in the first cycle or two of the therapy, and importantly, nobody on study has required a dose reduction for, for these side effects. Outside of this, I wanna make one important point, which is not as commonly seen, but seen in 9% of our patients at grade three or higher, so serious grade toxicities, is a phenomenon known as capillary leak syndrome. This is something we've reported previously. Capillary leak syndrome essentially is a vascular leak phenomenon, and uh, seen in several patients at a serious level, it led the co-investigators and I to make serious protocol amendments and changes, both at study entry, which is focusing on the albumin or the major protein level in the body to make sure people have an adequate amount, and then daily rigorous monitoring during the trial of daily weights, albumins, and fluid status. 
Rick, since we've been able to do these measures, no further patients have had any serious events of this capital leak syndrome wow. in the BPDCN cohort. So what's next? What a great question. So for the future, because we have the early encouraging results thus far, as we showed yesterday, the future is to continue in this expansion phase two cohort now that we have a dose for the study drug and to continue on with that study. Also, if the results continue to be as positive as they have been, we hope, the co-investigators and I hope that this can serve for the potential for the basis of a registration trial for patients. Again, there are no standard approved therapies at all for patients with BPDCN. So this has to be exciting. I mean, to come up with something where there's, there is nothing and to actually develop something that, I, that looks like it's going to work. You know, I, I totally agree. As a physician in the clinic, as I told you, the, the young man that I took care of some eight years ago when I had no clinical trials to offer at that time, it is a very rewarding uh, rewarding phenomenon. For our patients and their families, one thing I can tell you is with the predominance now of the internet and social media, if you can believe it, patients and families are now finding us saying, wow, there's somebody like you or like the co-investigators who have a dedicated focus to PPDCN, you have a clinical trial, and of course, encouraging results thus far. So from a physician standpoint, patient and family, and then you're right, from a research standpoint, my hope my intention, my hypothesis, is that this opens the door to much more research to come. Combination therapies, new targeted agents, further exploration of this study drug, and it shows that in a rare disease or a rare cancer, if you can have a few major discoveries and findings, and a few groups of interested parties, that you can really move a field forward rather quickly. Well, we have a number of really interesting interviews we've managed to do here at ASCO. Please look around online for those, and of course, in print too, Badge Clinical News. For American Medical Communications, I am Rick McGuire, Executive Editor.